Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to Scaling the Use of Loan Guarantees in Impact Investing. My name is Dr. Nellie Garten. Pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder at Tablecloth, an impact analytics company working with private equity and venture capital, as well as CDFIs to measure and manage their environmental, social, and governance impact. Uh, I also have the pleasure of serving as the chair of the investment committee for the Wilson Foundation, who has used loan guarantees in our transition over to impact investing. And I'm pleased to welcome you as a board member of Catalyst San Diego and Imperial Counties, as well as uh, being the founding chair of the San Diego Impact Investor Network and Catalyst's Impact Investment Committee. Um, we bring education and actionable projects to the region's investors and philanthropic funders to grow and coordinate social change capital in the places it's needed the most. Today, we'll be exploring loan guarantees, which tap into funders' assets to help nonprofits demonstrate creditworthiness and secure capital. You'll hear about strategies that utilize partnerships to give foundations and other lenders comfort to invest in projects they might otherwise view as risky. At Catalyst, a network of 150 funders and impact investors, we believe in the power of meaningful collabor collaboration. Today, we'll learn how working together supports the proven practice of loan guarantees to advance a funder's mission alongside grants and direct investments. We'll be hearing from Andy Ballister, founder at BeQuest Foundation, and Sarah Lyman, executive director at Alliance Healthcare Foundation, who will discuss their partnership as guarantors on the Yes in God's Backyard initiative to provide affordable housing. We'll also hear from Jim Beck, executive director and, uh, at Community Investment Guarantee Pool, a national pooled guaranteed fund uh, and one-stop shop for lenders to combine resources and expertise. Before we start, I'd like to share a few housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording afterwards. Uh, we've scheduled Q&A with our speakers later in the session. However, feel free to drop any questions into the chat and we'll work to weave them in throughout the conversation. At the end of our webinar, we'll share a three question poll. We would appreciate you completing this brief, brief survey to uh, share your feedback. It helps us to improve future programs. I'd also like to thank Bank, Bank of America for generously sponsoring this impact investing series and making today's session possible. I'm now pleased to introduce Pamela Gabriel, Senior Vice President, San Diego Market, executive at Bank of America to share why the session and series are important to her team. Thank you so much, Nellie, and thank you to Megan and Carlos for your wonderful partnership. It is always such a pleasure to work with Catalyst. For us at Bank of America, truly, it really is about giving back to our community and providing that education so that our communities are very prepared, especially to invest back from a social um, imp impact investing perspective. And so for us, our partnership with Catalyst allowed us to come up with four different topics to partner and bring to you these types of conversations so that we can learn more about how we can support our communities. So I think we've already had strategic investments into small business, strategic strategies for impacting investing in Imperial County, and then now this particular topic, which I think will be very valuable to a lot of the individuals here today. Um, for us at Bank of America, it really, we are focused on supporting economic mobility within our communities. And in my particular role, as well as my team, we look at how we can really provide back this investment, not only from a financial standpoint, but also education. So this is truly is in alignment with what we're trying to achieve here. And so I am excited to partner with you all. I'm excited for this topic today. And with that, I am going to be handing it over to Andy Ballester, I may have said that wrong, the founder of BeQuest Foundation and the moderator for this particular series. Thank you again for having us here today. And to look forward to the session. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Um, here we go. 
Okay. <clears throat> Uh, I'm excited to be the moderator today. Uh, I think loan guarantees are an exciting way to um, to have impact with the corpus of your account. So at Bequest Foundation, we've had several opportunities uh, in the past couple of years to use loan guarantees as, as part of the way that we have impact out there. Um, I'd love to chat with you just a, a little bit about kind of how we have looked at loan guarantees, and then we're going to be um, uh, talking to, uh, to Jim and Sarah about their experience in the field. And so um, at Bequest, uh, we love this as part of our toolkit. Our philosophy is that philanthropy and impact investing is there to take risks. Uh, we can prove out models for the market, banking institutions, and government, and loan guarantees plays a big role in this. Uh, they allow capital to flow to institutions and communities that normally have poor access to that capital. And lastly, as a private foundation, um, you know, we want to think about how do we go on beyond the the five percent uh, minimum distribution? How do we um, how do we start to mobilize uh, the rest of that ninety five percent? And and loan guarantees gives us a way to to do that um, without a lot of financial headache, headache and a lot of um, uh, in a lot of instances. And so here's some uh, kind of quick examples of what we've been working on. Um, our two focus areas are, are housing and the climate, climate crises. Uh, so one of the ways we're addressing climate um, is that uh, this project is called Sun for All. Uh, nonprofits that own their buildings or provide multifamily housing can't take advantage of the same solar rebates and financing uh, that everybody else gets to. Uh, and shout out to Lee in the crowd I seen out there. He's a, uh, he and Collective Sun are our partners on this. Um, if we could source cheap capital for building solar for nonprofits, we could feasibly create a payment plan where they pay back a low interest loan um, that costs them less than their current electricity bill. And then over the lifetime of the panels, they're saving uh, about double the cost of their system. And so uh, this sounds awesome because that money goes right back to, uh, to their programs and we'd have a meaningful uh, impact on, on greenhouse gases over the lifetime of the panels. So the problem with that is we need capital at a pretty low cost. And um, so far we've had a hard time identifying uh, impact investors in the climate space that wanna participate in this. And so what we were able to do um, at Bequest was to guarantee a line of credit at uh, with our banking partner, Banking Bank of America, and um, and we're able to bring ten million dollars to this space to start building and deploying later this year. Um, so that was uh, that was one of our our bigger wins late, lately with uh, loan guarantees is to be able to start to use capital outside of our organization and bring that into something where we know it's going to come back. It's a pretty safe bet. Um, Collective Sun has that down to a science. And so how do we how do we just scale it? And so we're using loan guarantees to scale. Um, another one that we've, we've done in the last couple of years is in the climate space as well. Uh, we worked with our um, technical assistance partner, Mac, um, for sourcing uh, loans for electric vehicles to LMI community members in San Diego. And um, this affects change at several different levels. So for us, you know, we, we look at the greenhouse gas reduction, but uh, when we surveyed our potential borrowers, um, we're, we're looking at uh, folks who have car loans at 23% um, and exchanging them for 5% interest at car loans. <laughs> like that's a big difference on a month to month basis. Also, when you own an electric vehicle versus um, you know, current standard uh, vehicle, the cost of ownership is a lot lower. In a lot of instances, we're also working with partners uh, where uh, the place they live actually has solar and could have electric vehicle chargers. So we're talking about lower costs of, of gas uh, or, or, you know, the energy you need to make the vehicle go. And then the maintenance costs are uh, just, you know, markedly lower. So to produce this, um, we also needed capital at a very low cost. We found a banking partner that uh, was very interested in helping us with this. 
but they couldn't square the underwriting uh, in this example. And so Beneficial State Bank was basically uh, helped us form this program of if we can have uh, you know, 15% of a fund guaranteed, we can unlock $2 million to go to car loans. And, um, and uh, we had a model where that 15%, you know, that was pretty assured that it was coming back to us after this program got up and running. Um, they just couldn't, they just couldn't get over the hurdle of underwriting that themselves. And so for us to take a risk on this, so we, we put in 300K into a loan guarantee. And in this instance, we did have to move that money. I, and I think Jim's gonna talk to us about some other models of, of not having to touch where funds are. Uh, we were able to bring $2 million into uh, car loans for low income uh, folks in San Diego. And that was really exciting because as an update to this, um, this has been going fairly well. And actually because uh, beneficial state bank was able to kind of prove the model on this. They have uh, changed their underwriting and they're in the future now essentially underwriting this themselves. And so because of a loan guarantee, we're able to um, scale this to an institution that now can do this, uh, you know, in a, a bigger way than we could have. Um, and so that was really exciting as well. Um, the last one I, I just want to quickly go through is uh, something that we got to participate as, as in 2020 um, in uh, San Diego Community Power is a locally managed nonprofit agency that's uh, become the new uh, electric generation service provider for everyone in San Diego, Encinitas, La Mesa, and Chula Vista. And, um, this was an idea uh, that has just come online, but it's been in the works for quite a while. In uh, early 2020, they had a, um, an underwriting mishap where if they did not raise $5 million for a loan guarantee uh, for their underwriting, the initial startup loan that they had would not have gone through and we would not be enjoying San Diego community power right now. And because of the complexity of their capital stack, there were some things that really couldn't wait a year to delay. And so uh, Bequest with another funder was able to put together um, their loan guarantee. And because of that, uh, you know, we now have uh, SDCP and some great stats from them. They are at 50% renewable energy um, compared to sdg &E's standard mix of 31% uh, about. Um, their rates are a little bit better um, and then a quick commercial for them. If, if you have a business in one of those five cities I mentioned, or, uh, or you live in one of those five cities, you can actually opt into 100% renewable power. And I would appreciate if, if people looked through that. I, I can send out materials on how to do it. It's really easy. Um, 71,000 customers have already been served across all five participating uh, cities. And so this is uh, something that's you know already at scale, and we'll continue uh, to push forward on uh, local renewables. So we're really excited about that. So in those three things, you know, we look at those and we're like, okay, we create a new capital for new profit nonprofits. We got an institutional partner to take over loan guarantees at scale, and we provided startup capital for a much needed local renewable power generation um, resource. And so. Uh, you know, we think it's very exciting at <laughs> Bequest. And so I'd love to hear from uh, Jim. I know he's going to talk through some of the innovations they're creating uh, at, in this space at CIGP. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's great, Andy. Um, can folks hear me okay? Andy? Yeah, okay, great. Um, I feel like with uh, what Andy led off with and the real life examples that he he gave that it's it really I mean uh, I think my task is to just you know I think he made the case for why this is exciting and this is uh, needed I think my my task I think will be to just explain what we've been doing at CIGP and how we've made it easier for some foundations to um, to to kind of add this to their toolkit so. Um, 
thank you, thank you, Andy, thank you, Pamela, thank you, Catalyst, for hosting this. And yeah, thank you for. Um, I do have a short deck, but um, I think largely I'll just I'll just kind of talk, and and I may reference it in in one or two instances. So. My name is Jim Beck. I'm the executive director of the Community Investment Guarantee Pool. Um, it's a program that is managed by Locus Impact Investing. Uh, Locus is a national nonprofit uh, consultancy and mission-driven investment advisory that works with foundations and other investors to develop strategies for sourcing, structuring, diligencing, and servicing uh, managing impact investments. Um, so. Before I get into kind of Locus, I'm just gonna, uh, in terms of you know what I'm gonna cover, it will be you know a brief overview of Locus, and then also I'm hoping that um, building on Andy, that I can you know share some of the the reasons the reasons and learnings that we've had with our guarantors investors um, with you all, and hoping that that may be um, you know relevant and and interesting um, for Catalyst and its members here in, in San Diego. Um, so if, uh, if you could, uh, proceed one slide, thank you. So we launched in December of 2019, uh, with about a dozen investors. Um, here you see some of the, the, um, the members of our initial cohort. And, um, the intent was really to, uh, pioneer the aggregation and deployment of philanthropic guarantees to catalyze more capital into community development for three areas, affordable housing, small business, and climate change. Um, and to also challenge some of the inequities, particularly racial inequalities that have been uh, pervasive in the allocation of capital, even, in the, even within the community development sector. Um, if you could go to the next slide. So um, in terms of the kind of the value proposition of CIGP, um, we're attempting to work at a few different levels. Um, so for the guarantor investors um, on, the, on the left-hand side, um, we're really trying to lower the barriers to entry to what we think is an important tool. And as, as Andy referenced, there's, you know, foundations have a 5% a payout uh, requirement. Um, Obviously, there's a need to kind of have the endowment invested in the market to support future um, grant making uh, and impact investing uh, needs. And the, the opportunity here is by having a, an unfunded commitment to backstop uh, the issuance of guarantees. We're saying, you know, you can maintain, you don't need current liquidity to fund these guarantees. Um, you just need to know that there are uh, guarantees being deployed um, along the guidelines that, that we have all agreed to, and we'll provide you with reporting so that you can manage um, the, the, um, the investment side and the liquidity profile of your, of your endowment. Um, the, the other, you know, obviously big kind of benefit here for guarantors is that we're mitigating some of the financial risk by sharing that risk. It's a portfolio of guarantees. And so there's some um, diversity, uh, diversification uh, benefits, but also some learning benefits from just having a portfolio of guarantees out there. Um, in terms of the beneficiaries or the users of the guarantee, I think we're, we're trying to do a few things here. Where one, I think the biggest thing is we're trying to help them experiment and kind of what Andy referenced, which is that they have an idea of where they'd like to do more or different, um, but they don't have historical data uh, to kind of make the case to investors or to the boards. And so that's where we can step in and provide a bit of kind of risk boxing, downside protection, so that they can go forward with, with this experiment and, and see if that's something that they can, you know, go forward without, uh, without the support of, of, a, of a guarantee. And so, that's, that's really the, the main benefit is that we allow uh, the beneficiaries to, uh, we, we provide a, a kind of a structured, uh, flexible guarantee that can be structured to the needs of that particular uh, guarantor. And instead of dealing with you know, multiple guarantors um, or credit enhancement providers, you can, you can just work with us to kind of structure that guarantee in the way that you need to. Um, the, the other kind of you know, underlying benefit here is that we're trying to uh, disrupt some of the, the historic inequities. And so 
if um, you know, there are promising innovative opportunities that for whatever reason haven't been, um, have been underfunded, have been, uh, there have been, uh, you know, concerns around risk, um, uh, just issues of um, racial inequality, inequity, then we're saying that, you know, the, the, the nature of all of the guarantees and the underlying transactions are supporting have a intentional focus around advancing racial equity, have uh, an intentional focus around um, innovation and kind of addressing uh, problems that couldn't be, um, couldn't be looked at before for, for risk concerns. Um, that is the, you know, kind of the, the underlying mission here. And so we, we wanna make sure that those benefits are, um, are hitting low, low moderate income communities. We also wanna make sure that those learnings are not only being uh, taken in by the guarantee users, the beneficiaries, but also the greater community development sector field. And, you know, understanding, of course, that we're, at this point, we're, we're a $40 million uh, a guarantee fund. So, you know, pretty, pretty ambitious uh, uh, kind of theory of change, if you will, for, for something that's $40 million. Um, the, I guess the other thing that I would just mention is that we want to show that this is something that can be uh, financially sustainable for for the guarantors themselves. So, in other words, there you know, uh, it, it's it's not the primary motive is not to show that it's um, uh, that the that the insurance premiums, the like credit enhancement premiums, are a um, you know an economically um, kind of lucrative thing for uh, insurance providers, but that that is something that can compensate for risk. Um, we make it clear with our guarantors that you know, the expectation is that there will be cause on the guarantee. And once there are cause, it's unlikely that there'll be any recovery. And so they understand that, that there's a, there, there's a um, kind of a prioritization of that impact, but that on the other hand, that there is a, um, uh, an opportunity to do this in a self-sufficient way where the operating costs, um, asset management, structuring, sourcing, underwriting, all of that can be borne by the insurance um, premiums that are, are paid by the beneficiaries. Um, Carlos, if you could go to the, the next slide. Um, just kind of more of a pictorial uh, depiction of how the, the guarantee pool works with the different um, parties that are involved. On the right-hand side are the, I think this is somewhat, um, it's a, from a few months back where you see some of the, the guarantee users that we've been working with. It is a it is a national footprint, um, and so um, the at least initially uh, many of the beneficiaries that we were working with um, were were the larger kind of national focus uh, CDFIs that had um, a program that they wanted to uh, stand up around affordable housing. Um, many of them were focused around um, providing equity like capital to BIPOC. Um, and smaller uh, women-led developers who traditionally have had um, a difficulty kind of accessing in an efficient way the capital needed to um, move projects along. So it was interesting that we saw a, a couple of use cases, um, slightly different, but um, uh, use cases kind of being stood up by um, uh, the intermediaries in that space. Um, and if you could just keep going. So if you could just go one more and then I'm gonna ask you to just flip back. Um, this is, so we actually have seven um, guarantees that we've written um, a little over 16 million. Um, as you can see, most have been in housing, two have been in small business. Uh, the, the seventh one that you don't see here is is with um, a small business lender in the Northwest called Business Impact Northwest that is, um, rolling out a um, uh, kind of underserved startup and ITIN uh, lending program for the, for the Northwest. Um, but again, kind of the same concept of uh, enabling um, intermediaries to experiment, to um, you know, kind of grow their credit box and to also introduce new products that are, um, you know, more, uh, allow them to kind of uh, better align with their uh, impact priorities. If you could just go back one slide, just this is a kind of a high level snapshot of the 
the parameters of the program, the um, the kind of the key terms. Um, it's pretty pretty broad, and that's intentional. Um, we we really want it to be flexible to the needs of the guarantee users. Um, right now, kind of the maximum term is about 13 years. Uh, the pricing is about one to two percent. Um, there are three basic types of guarantees. Um, without getting into too much detail, there's we can we can kind of backstop a, an entity or an organization. We can backstop a portfolio on a pool basis, or we can backstop. Um, uh, kind of a loan by loan or asset by asset uh, uh, basis program. And we typically, I think this is, a, this is an important point, we typically want to have risk alignment. And so what that means is that we want to share in, in any losses or uh, guarantee calls. So if there are calls on the guarantee, we want to make sure that the, the, the beneficiary itself is also bearing some of that risk. Um, obviously, we understand that the whole point of this is that they want to be able to kind of box out some of that risk. And so we're, we're providing a floor in terms of how much they're impacted, but um, we, we, don't want, we don't want it to be a situation where we're providing 100% um, loss protection, for example. And we can provide guarantees around um, uh, credit, liquidity, um, you know, non-payment, uh, other, other factors. I think I saw a question, but, or a comment, but I, I it's disappeared from my screen. Yeah, it, we, uh, from Megan, uh, how does the pricing work? Uh, from whom to whom on the, the pricing side? Yeah, so it's from CIGP to the uh, beneficiaries, to the, to the uh, intermediaries that are users of the guarantee. Um, it's on the committed amount. And so um, if, the, if the guarantee is for a you know, million dollars, um, then they're they're paying one to two percent on that million. Now, from a from an intermediary perspective, and I think you your example has really highlighted this well, is that the underlying transactions that are being supported with the credit enhancement, like a million dollar guarantee, might actually be supporting, you know, ten million or twenty million of underlying activity. And so, um, from their perspective, that that you know uh, the cost is a little bit. Um, uh, diluted, uh, if you will, or amortize over the whole lending program. Um, and of course, that's an important factor that, in, that kind of like leverage factor, the fact that we're with that million, we're unlocking 20 million of community development capital that otherwise would not have been there exactly in that, um, in that scenario of, 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 you know, providing a, a, a loans around the terms that are being offered. That's kind of a key part of the value proposition for our for our investors. Um, so I think maybe I'll just stop there and um, just say I think the last slide has uh, my contact info. If there's any questions, uh, I also realized that looking at it that there's an September 24th deadline for an RFP letter uh, intent, the statement of intent around our climate change. Um, I think just one quick comment on that, which is that we're, we're looking at the intersection of, you know, affordable housing, small business and climate change with equity and uh, community finance. And I think affordable housing, small business, that's, a, that's an intersection that a lot of people are familiar with. Around climate, it's less familiar, and so we're doing, you know, we're soliciting specific uh, RFPs at that intersection, um, just because we we think that there are some ideas out there that we're just not seeing through our regular network. And so I think one of the topics we're going to talk about was just sourcing strategies. Uh, happy to talk about that more, but we decided to just be a little bit more front-footed about about the climate side. Um, we just, you know, we think that it it needs to. Um, that the opportunities and the need really um, kind of at that intersection of look, thinking about racial equity and climate change is, is so great. Um, and that uh, community finance has something to offer in that space. And we'd like to understand how we can, we can help that scale. Excellent. So, so as you brought on foundations to be uh, guarantors as part of this pool, what are some of the features of those guarantees that that appeal to their board of directors and the chief investment officers at the foundation. Yeah, so I, 
I would say that, um, you know, it, it, it's a few things. And I think we, we talked about some, you know, the, the leverage, the unlocking of additional community capital. So, you know, 1 million kind of unlocking 20 million, 10 million. Um, I think it was, you know, I think they can understand that pretty clearly. They can also understand the benefit of keeping, you know, part of their endowment or keeping their endowment in the market, um, whether it's, you know, through the various CIO strategies and, and kind of continuing to benefit and grow the endowment that way, but also being able to support, further support their mission through an unfunded commitment. Obviously, there's a risk and we make it, you know, super clear that, look, our intent is not to, we intend to call some of it. If we don't call Elliot any of it, then our, our experiment has, has not worked. Um, but we, we want to keep you uh, very well informed. So we're trying to, on a quarterly basis, we'll do, you know, analysis of expected loss based on kind of how the, um, the deployment is going with the beneficiaries. I think that sort of transparency and reporting is, is important and, and provides some comfort to the uh, to the foundation and, and the board. Um, yeah, and I think there's just, you know, here's an opportunity for economies to scale all around how yeah. to do, um, how to add this to your kind of uh, um, toolkit, uh, uh, impact investment toolkit. I think, you know, we're trying to be open source in that it, 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 we're not saying that every foundation needs to join CIGP. Obviously, there sometimes the, the overlap of like geographic preferences, um, all of our foundations, many of them have geographic preferences. They've, they've kind of set that aside to some degree to join CIGP. We understand that there are preferences and we try to, to uh, allocate guarantees there, but th that's not always a guarantee. But um, I think that's, you know, I think we're, 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 we're saying you can take these learnings and, and maybe stand up a, a regional focus or something that has a more programmatic focus that, that's aligned with your mission. Yeah, I think that that's great. That kind of leads into one of the one of the questions I had, which was for a, a place based organization like ours. Um, you know, it, are there plans in the future for CIGP to to have that kind of regional stand up? Or is this something that we should think about replicating locally um, to to guarantee our own project? I would say both. Uh, <laughs> I think um, we've had a lot of interest and that's that's been something I so I started in, in mid July and that wasn't something that was really on the radar. I, I, I kind of I knew what what, um, you know, uh, philanthropic guarantees and unfunded guarantees and kind of the, the, the value of that. But I did not really expect that that interest was so pervasive from a place based perspective and also from a um, from an issue area perspective. And so we've been, we've been kind of providing ad hoc, I would say support uh, around that. Um, I think it is something that we're thinking about whether it would be, you know, obviously separate from CIGP, whether Locus itself could provide, take some of the learnings that we've had through the CIGP management experience and, and help uh, with uh, other, other attempts. I think, you know, you're doing it in, 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 you know, in your program areas, Andy. And I think, um, you know, it happens all the time in regular finance where a syndicate is formed or a, mm -hmm. a club deal and you kind of lead it. And sometimes you do it on an informal basis, but then you do it enough and it becomes repeatable and very scaled. And so I think we're saying that at an informal level, you can do that too. I mean, yeah, I'll just stop there. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's awesome. And I see some, uh, I see SDGIP <laughs> in the chat uh, now getting a plus one. So um, uh, I know you took on the executive director role at a community investment guarantee project pretty recently. Um, what brought you to this work and, and, uh, and how, yeah. uh, how's the project, you know, how's the rubber met the road uh, as far as what is actually happening out there? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Thank you for asking that. Um, um, I would I would say that it was you know it was really just having a chance to like I've been in community development, impact investing, and regular finance for twenty plus years at this point, and I think you know there there have been a lot of efforts, um, and it, and community development has been vital, right? Um, affordable housing. Uh, small business 
support um, CDFIs, all of that work. And it's been, you know, billions and hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, but I think we can all agree that some of the, the challenges here and for us, like the, the, you know, the threshold challenges are around climate and racial equity and, and other things that have just been there and, and kind of uh, are, are things that, that I think community development and society as a whole needs to take on. And I think the opportunity is there, the need is certainly there and it requires a lot more capital uh, than what's, what's present even within the broader kind of ESG world. If, if you want to include all of that. And so I think that um, just to kind of drive home the point, I think it, there's hundreds of billions of dollars in philanthropic assets just in the US, probably on PlaySpace. And if you could just unlock a sliver of that towards mission, um, that could just, that could really support a lot of projects that have been kind of sidelined because of risk concerns. So I think that was the main thing. Um, I think where I've, come in it's I've understood that it's you know that's a great that's a great kind of opening uh, entree but there are a lot of complications obviously to kind of scaling up a model and and demonstrating sustainability and um, uh, just you know kind of looking at opportunities and thinking about an assortment of different um, uh, impact priorities I love it yeah, that's uh, the, I I love that uh, kind of vision of it. I think it you know it's it's unlocking more uh, assets flowing into the community, and and if we can do that, um, we can start to to chip away at some of these problems. Um, thank you so much, Jim. Uh, and and folks, if you have questions uh, for Jim, we're going to come back to Q and A a little bit later, um, so I can moderate through those in a little bit. Um, Sarah. <laughs> Uh, if you would, uh, can you start us off with kind of your philosophy that guides your work in impact investing? Yeah, sure. Happy to. Um, you know, I mean, at the risk of being a bit repetitive, I just think, you know, reiterating the point made earlier that as a private foundation, our entire operations and grant making efforts are supported by the investment income from our endowment. And so, you know, in order to be able to continue making grants into the future, most private foundations still invest the bulk of their corpus in traditional vehicles like the stock market. So what that would mean is that up to 95% of our assets are just essentially sidelined from generating positive impact that we wanna see. So for us at Alliance, um, you know, we view impact investing as a critical strategy to catalyze more dollars towards achieving our local mission. So I think I'm just like doubling and tripling down on what you and, and Jim articulated earlier, but it, I share the same philosophy and I think it's critical. Um, I know Alliance has also um, done loan guarantees. And so uh, for you as the executive director, what was it like uh, walking you know, your board through that process of, of how to start doing loan guarantees in a foundation? Yeah, so loan guarantees are a newer tool for us. So I think, you know, I was, I was learning a ton even on this call listening to the two of you talk about some of the examples that you shared. Um, but for us, you know, I mean, similar to other program related investments that we would make, you know, we, our board really wanted to be sure that like any project under consideration for a guarantee would meaningfully advance our missions first and foremost. Like we got to be comfortable that, you know, that that's the case. And then, also, you know, have some comfort that any potential financial risk we might be taking on is worth it to catalyze the impact that like we got to be comfortable, you know, depending on the level of, of risk or like sort of exposure, the timeline of exposure of a particular guarantee, like asking the question, are we willing to potentially convert some or all of this into a grant in order to catalyze, you know, the change. And so I think, you know, in the case of Yigby, which, um, you know, Andy's, Andy's a big thought partner and sort of um, designer behind this cool project in San Diego, which stands for Yes in God's Backyard. Um, you know, we knew that catalyzing 16 units of critically important housing for homeless veterans, and also in partnership with the oldest African-American church in San Diego was like totally aligned with our mission. And I just think that's such a great straightforward example because really all we're doing is helping this church who has available land obtain traditional lending from a bank, but they can't put their church up as collateral for that. I mean, that would be sort of pretty significant mission creep, right? And so we use our endowment and, you know, we partnered with several others, including Bequest, 
to do that. And so I think it was just a great way to de-risk um, that loan for a traditional lender. And the fact that we had partner multiple partners involved, we share that risk and we also share the incentive to make, make it successful. So um, I think that was a good example. So for us, it was a really great win-win and I think a good kind of early um, proof point. Obviously there's a lot more work on that particular project to sort of come to fruition, but it caused us and our board to say like, this is a win-win. We don't, you know, we're still getting market rate returns unless and if this is called upon. In the meantime, this project has now been catalyzed. Like, how can we find more of these? You know, how do we source more opportunities to put our balance sheet to work that way? Awesome. And and so now, um, now that you have this additional tool, and I, I know you've been really innovative in uh, how you uh, use impact investing versus grant making in the community. Um, what types of conversations do you have with potential grantees slash borrowers slash, you know, um, grant, uh, I guess, loan uh, guarantees uh, type situations in, yeah. in that impact area? Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, I think we work a lot with nonprofits as a funder, right, as a grant maker, like most of you on this call. And so, you know, some are more familiar with the idea of other sorts of capital and many aren't, especially some of the smaller nonprofits that, you know, are typically are used to working with foundations and writing grant applications and seeking grant funding. And so, um, you know, it takes a bit of education to help folks understand that, like, this is a way for us to add more dollars on top of our grant funding, on top of what we already do into the impact space. And so for some, you know, it's like, why would a foundation be asking for a return or in the case of a guarantee, like, why don't you just give us the grant? And it's sort of like, you know, this is additional money that otherwise would just be sitting in Wall Street. That's what I always tell people. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of education that um, this is a tool. It doesn't always make sense, right? Like a lot of things are not well positioned for impact investments or guarantees, but when they are, when there's expected, you know, revenue to offset expenses, it's a powerful tool. And so, you know, I mean, I think both of you articulated it really well earlier with some concrete examples, but with guarantees specifically, you know, there's benefits such as helping leverage private capital into an impact focused deal where the economics aren't very attractive commercial, from a commercial perspective, right? From a risk return profile. Um, or I think Yigby probably falls into this, this latter category, you know, helping investors gain comfort and familiarity with either a new sector, a new business model, you know, or a borrower that doesn't have either sufficient credit or collateral to, to satisfy underwriting guidelines. Um, so it can both buy down the cost of the capital or just make it accessible in the first place for borrowers that you know otherwise wouldn't be able to, to obtain that financing. Um, and then the other like sort of like long-term benefit is then they build a relationship with that lender, right? And are able to demonstrate that they're a, a trustworthy borrower that can hopefully utilize that partnership in the future for other projects. And so, um, so yeah, I mean, I think when we have conversations with folks, it's really around like, we have a lot of tools at our discretion, you know, from grant making to, you know, loans to equity investments to guarantees. And each tool is only, you know, the right fit for certain types of projects. And so really trying to put that puzzle piece together and make the match. Um, it's kind of fun. <laughs> That's awesome. And so, and so along that, um, you, Alliance Healthcare has, put, uh, has, has done a lot of thinking and thought leadership into this. So when they think about, um, I, I guess, both loan guarantees and impact investing, uh, Megan asks, what percentage of your, of your assets under management, you know, do you obligate to loan guarantees or impact investments? Do you have a hard and fast rule there? Um, yeah. Because we don't have guidance. <laughs> you know, we've been kind of making this up as, as we go along at Bequest as it makes yeah. sense. You know, we do. Um, I think, you know, our board, um, even before I joined Alliance, a few years before that, sort of said like, okay, let's put a, let's put an allocation or kind of a stake in the ground to get started in impact investing. And so they set aside 10% of our entire um, corpus towards impact investing. And I think guarantees are still a really small slice of that, that we'd like to grow. Um, but we're exciting. Like we're nearing a point where we're going to be fully deployed pretty soon. So for us, you know, we have about an $86 million endowment um, and we're going to be at that allocation limit. And so one of my goals, and I think really have a lot of co-champions, you know, on my board and staff is like, what will it take for us to expand that pool? I'd like to see us double it. 
at least, <laughs> and then maybe continue to grow. I think, um, you know, with loan guarantees specifically, it's another, it's a tool I'd like to see us utilize more often for a couple big reasons. One, one of the barriers for our, for our board, and I think a lot of finance committees to, you know, ex, um, grow our impact investment portfolio is that we do a lot of like below market, you know, PRIs that are earning three or 2%. And um, when you, you know, the more you carve out of your traditional investment portfolio, the more that starts to eat into your ability to give grants and, and to have operations into perpetuity and, you know, continue to thrive and grow. But with guarantees, especially, you know, the kind that Jim was talking about, the way that we use them for Yigby, we're still able to catalyze that change and keep our money in the meantime, you know, in the stock market earning market rate returns. So that's one reason. And then I think the other, you know, we've discussed another, we have a few um, impact investments that we've made that are pretty long-term, you know, debt type investments. And, you know, it might be, you know, depending on cost of capital or what a partner is sort of doing in the meantime, there might be opportunity to sort of have a conversation with those partners and say, hey, what if we transition that existing debt and maybe maybe there's another project you want to tack on or sort of like increase the, the borrowing power here. And we transition it to a guaranteed, you know, loan with a traditional lender. You build a relationship with that organization. We're still on the hook, so to speak. But in the meantime, you know, you potentially are building credit with this, you know, lender, potentially freeing up some short-term cash flow to tackle a new project. And we get some liquidity back to invest in other projects. So we're kind of having those conversations internally, like it won't make sense for a lot of our partners, but for some, it really might be a win-win. Um, so yeah, I, I hopefully you'll see us, you know, begin to grow that allocation over time. I really like that thought of, of um, when you're in a long-term impact investment, revisiting that and seeing if there's some other tools that you can use to kind of free up those. We, we haven't thought about that before. I think that's a really interesting idea that we could probably talk to some partners that we've been in with in a longer term sort of thing. That's mm -hmm. cool. Um, as, so as funders learn about uh, ways to leverage these non-grant making sort of assets, um, what, what is your vision for the future of impact investing? Yeah, I mean, I would just like, I think like most of you on this call, I'd love to see more foundations put their balance sheets to work towards impact. You know, we we spend all this time and energy managing like five or six or maybe 7% of our money towards impact. And, you know, like, let's be intellectually honest about that and sort of think about like, what's the remainder of that money actually doing? We probably don't know is the answer. And even if we do, you know, you're so removed from that when it's in the market. So I just think, you know, I've seen like you, Andy, it's, I, I just have seen how impact investment dollars and guarantees as one example, um, just unlock capital that can get to places where traditionally there's been barriers to access, whether that's intentional or, you know, systemic in other ways. And I think it's part of our duty to mission to really be challenging that and trying to, you know, catalyze more capital towards those projects. And then the other thing is, you know, I'd really love to see more collaboration on larger projects. I think, you know, the Locus um, or the project that Jim was talking about is such a great example on kind of a national scale. But just to say, like, you know, it's one thing for us as individual foundations to be investing in these discrete deals that are great and they catalyze change and they're important and it's needed. But like, what could we do if we really start to think about what would it take, for example, let's talk about housing, you know, if we created some truly transformational, like bigger scale pool of patient impact capital or guarantee, loan guarantees as another example to catalyze housing solutions at scale versus like, you know, diligencing these individual projects on our own. When let's be, you know, like many foundations don't get into this space because they're not resourced to do real estate due diligence and, you know, like a traditional loan for a line of credit. I mean, you know, a lot of that is technical expertise that we don't always have internally. And so we, we don't really need to be recreating the wheel or, or replicating that sort of bandwidth every single time if we can do more of what Jim has built, you know, on a national scale. And I'd love to see us do something like that, you know, in San Diego. Um, and we can leverage all those time consuming, costly things um, together and create something that is much scale more scalable. 
that was a long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> no, amazingly well said. <laughs> I, I totally agree. I think that's so interesting. And, um, uh, you know, I think we, we could have a, a lot of leverage for, for the capital we're putting out there. Um, awesome. Well, so to open it up to everybody to ask questions and, uh, you know, I'm just going to put uh, some of these questions to, to both Jim and Sarah. Um, but uh, Susan asks, uh, you know, how can foundations hear of these deal opportunities to participate? And I know this is something that, you know, we at Bequest have had as a conversation as well. And we've certainly heard of quite a lot through the network at Catalyst. But um, how, what are some of the other ways that these deals come to, uh, to you all? I'm happy to take a stab. I mean, I think for us, you know, um, we, one, we try to sort of share that we do impact investing, you know, with our partners. So anytime we're meeting with nonprofits or community stakeholders, we mention it because you never know, it might trigger like a thought that just wasn't top of mind for somebody because they look at us as a grant maker usually, uh, first and foremost. So that's one. We also get a lot of potential pipeline from some of our local partners like Mission Driven Finance, you know, is doing a lot of innovative um, financing in a variety of sectors. And some of those really square nicely with our mission. And so we have a pretty regular cadence of, of vetting things that they're working on. And we've made a lot of connections through their partnerships too, I would say, um, you know, local CDFIs, um, you know, community economic development institutions can be really helpful in this space. And then we also do, um, we've for a long time sort of hosted a innovation um, competition for sort of social entrepreneurs that have some idea that could potentially be transformative for the populations that we serve and that has the potential to be sustainable and scalable in some way. And that could be through, you know, a market-based solution or some other systems change that sort of redirects dollars. Um, and we've gotten a lot of like, you know, people who'd applied to that program in the past and it wasn't quite the right fit or we didn't end up providing the million dollar grant for that project, but they actually were a great fit for our impact investment portfolio. And so that's another area for us that's been a great pipeline. And Jim, um, are there ways uh, through your programming at, at CGIGP that other funders hear about some of the, the things that you're doing? doing and, and um, maybe can participate in some way? Yeah, that's, that's a really, so right now we share, um, I guess just generally kind of on the, uh, the sourcing strategy, um, we have a, kind of a few different levels. I think one, um, our guarantors, the, the 12 kind of national and community uh, investors are a great source. So they, they come across something, they don't really want to throw kind of the, the people power at like, you know, evaluating it. They're not quite sure. So they kind of send it to us. Um, that's, that, that's a huge source. Um, I think just the network of folks that are staffing CIGP is, is another uh, important source. Um, I think just having, reg you know, and that means just having regular conversations like Sarah was, was mentioning mission driven finance with, with good partners who you know are looking at things that over well, overlap well. Um, I think the other thing that we've done is try to, because we have such a particular nexus that we're focused on around equity and influencing the rest of community development finance, we've, we've kind of stood up these financial, advisory teams with uh, thought leaders from affordable housing and climate change to kind of help us think about, like send us opportunities, obviously, but also think about, you know, themes that we should be kind of uncovering and people that we should be talking to, to understand like what, where are the, where's the innovation kind of, you know, pushing boundaries and where can we be helpful. So all of that has been really helpful. And then sometimes we just need to go do an RFP to get more to uncover more, but our pipeline is really pretty robust at this point. It's 120 million or so of a pipeline that we saw recently, which is, you know, we have 20 million in capacity. So we definitely are in the mode now of raising additional guarantor capital, guarantor commitments. And that's that's really important. If something is too big or something just doesn't fit, we, we will share it with our guarantors, if, especially if we know they have a very like, you know, Kind of dial down interest in that area 
Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your, your question. Yeah, and I think, I, I think you know, please reach out if there's, I think if there are things that, if there's a good point of entree for us, like if there's something around San Diego and workforce housing, like that if, if there's somebody that, you know, that may not be a fit for us for various reasons, but we can then, I can, I can certainly uh, pass it on. Excellent. Um, any other questions from the group here? Yes, this is Emily. Hi, I'm with uh, Red Up Impact Working Fund, and we focus specifically on employment social enterprises, so nonprofits or for profits that employ people with barriers. So I think it overlaps with the gym, with the workforce, uh, sorry, with the small business piece. Um, and I have two questions. One is, so our loans, our largest loan to date has been 500,000. So for us, in order to take advantage of this, it would have to be like a pooled, the pooled option. Um, so those loans, of course, are closed. So the underwriting is, is done. So how would that work if, if you had, it, like, it's already kind of, yeah. I just, is I this think, timing? I, is I just, yeah, I, I, I'll just be like, I'll just be very direct, I think on this one, just because I think, I think our preference would be just because again, our, there's a lot of demand, there's a lot of need. I think we would prefer to be backing new lending as opposed to, and I understand like funds are fungible and it's going to allow you to do more, but I think we would just from a kind of connecting the dots perspective, I think we'd be more interested in, in backing a new product or new terms versus okay. kind of an existing. And then it, it also kind of avoids the, we don't want to be a kind of after the fact backstop to mm -hmm. clean up a situation. Got it. Okay. So we, you know, there are some employment social enterprises that are larger, like the Goodwills of the world, groups like that. We haven't done a loan that large yet, but we expect to. Um, so my other question then is, do you require, because we've, we've experienced this with searching for other guarantees, um, do you require that the small business owners or founders provide personal guarantees on these loans? Because one of the things we're trying to model out with Red F is that um, trying to be more flexible, trying to, especially for a lot of our BIPOC leaders, not tying them up with a personal guarantee, but we found yeah. that that's limiting us getting access to other guarantees. So just curious for your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think going back to my point of like, I think we wanna let the beneficiaries, they're the experts on this market. They, they understand how they wanna address it. So I think we leave that to you. We would leave that to you in terms of how, you know, what your, what your kind of appetite is around what you'd like to do. We have one that is, you know, kind of where the equity by the entrepreneur is like, um, is kind of accum accumulated, if you will. Um, and it's not like economic equity, but the economic equity grows over over time. So it's, it's maybe it's a model similar to what you're talking about, but that was something that was really, you know, vital and unique for the beneficiary that we're, we're working with. It was unusual. We hadn't seen anything like that before, but it was it was interesting. Last question then, in, in terms of timing, or like, what is your process? Because I'm just curious when, at what point, it would be wise to if this is even something that there is alignment there, which I'm I'm not 100 percent sure, but it seems like there's some possible pieces. Um, how long does your process usually take to provide a guarantee? Yeah, so it some have taken like over a year <laughs> um others have kind of come together quicker um but i would say from like when we start to talk and you know because there's a lot to do on your end too um i think i think probably you know and you're probably asking somebody who shouldn't be answering this uh but just based on what i've seen so far and and i would say like eight months plus or minus but i think just you know, probably the easiest thing to do is to just reach out and we can start to give you feedback. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks for those questions, Emily. Those were awesome. Um, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand it over to Megan because I know we're at time, uh, but thank you all for your questions and, and thank you to both of our speakers, Sarah and Jim. That was, that was amazing. Um, Take it away. Thank you, Andy. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, nothing like having someone who's already, oh, sorry, you're getting like shined from my windows. Um, nothing 
like having somebody who's deep in the work also moderate such a fantastic conversation. Um, you know, we'll close it out here, but I just want to bring back a comment, one each that Sarah made and that Jim made. Um, and hi, I'm the president and CEO of Catalyst of San Diego and Imperial Counties. I'm so happy and grateful to Bank of America for making it possible for us to continue to bring new and innovative um, and old tried and true practices and in impact investing to the point that Sarah made about how much time and energy we spend managing 5% of what could be our impact um, and, and how important it is to think about all of the tools in our toolbox. And I just really love that Jim made a point to say, we make it clear that we do plan to call some of these commitments. Uh, and I think the, the implication there, the underlying concept is that if not, then we're not taking enough quote unquote risk. We're not actually getting into a place where we're filling a gap. We're just replacing um, capital that's already out there in the market. And the flexibility and the opportunity to think about you, I mean, essentially within regulations, um, philanthropy is the money that can do anything. You, you know, we talk about power dynamics and the fact that foundations and funders have the power and the folks in the, in about to use the capital don't like look for the reason to say yes, I think is what I take out of this. Um, and if we all were to do that, we would see so much impact on the ground. Uh, so email me if you want to be part of the emerging San Diego and Imperial County <laughs> uh, loan guarantee pool. So we'll get that going. Uh, thank you so much, Andy, Jim, Sarah. Thanks to Lee for moderating our chat. <laughs> um, and I'll just make a note that we had some non-foundations here. So let's think about everybody who has a balance sheet. Large nonprofits have a balance sheet. Individuals have assets in the bank. So this isn't just about institutions that we typically think about as funders. This is about the ecosystem of folks with resources of all kinds. Um, and that's what we're here to spark. So uh, have a wonderful day. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining us. Carlos will send out a very short poll. <laughs> Um, and join us for the next in this series of deep dives into impact investing for our communities.